folks, Dennis Hancock here, the grass man, uh, here with the grass lady, Dr. Lisa Baxter, who is a postdoc with us down in Tifton. Uh, Lisa's been really active down here at the Sunbelt Ag Expo, which is where we're at today. Uh, we're in between tram loads for the uh, uh, annual Sunbelt Ag Expo field day that they have down here. And, and uh, we've been doing a lot of work down here. Actually, Lisa's been doing a lot of work down here for uh, the Bermuda grass stem maggot. Um, but we established these uh, plots here behind us a few years ago, actually in the spring of 2016. Uh, we established what is known as the Forage Bermuda Grass Variety Garden down here so that we could actually look at some of these differences between the varieties uh, with Bermuda Grass Stem Maggot and, and maybe some other things too. And uh, For those that are not familiar with the Bermuda Grass Stem Maggot, it's a major issue that we've been having probably since uh, uh, 2010 is when it first started showing up in Ben Hill and Irwin counties. And um, Lisa actually did a master's research with us. Uh, uh, in what was, when were you here for your master's work? 2010 to, or 2012 to 2014. 12 to 14, yep. So, and then she went off to uh, Texas Tech to do her PhD, and then we, we wooed her back to, <laughs> uh, to Tifton uh, to do some of the work down here. Um, I do want to recognize that the assistance that we got with the establishment of the variety garden here, uh, Gordon Crosby, who is a local uh, sprig producer and, and sprigger, uh, came down and, and sprigged this in for us, uh, provided some sprigs and sprigged it in. And then Floyd Knowles, who's over in McCray, uh, provided some sprigs of uh, Russell. And then, of course, uh, Dr. Bill Anderson, who is our uh, forage breeder down in Tifton, uh, provided some uh, Coast Cross 2 sprigs down here as well. So, Lisa, tell us a little bit about what you've got going on down here for, uh, for the research that we've been doing down here. So this is all building off of Bill Anderson's work in Tifton. We just wrapped up a three-year research trial there um, comparing uh, sprayed and unsprayed different uh, Bermuda grass varieties. And so with those, we can expect up to 50% damage in small plots during the peak season, uh, which is what we're calling late July to early September. Uh, unfortunately, that's in plots, and so we wanted to do that on a larger scale that you see behind us. And we have similar varieties down here, so the six of the most popular ones, and we're just looking at how much the stem maggot can hurt the yield, the quality, and the economics on this large scale. Um, so this is piggybacking off of a lot of other trials that have only been done in small plots, and it's really better mimicking what we see on producers' in farms. In the real world, yeah. Yeah, I think that's the thing about doing small mm -hmm. plots versus larger plots like mm -hmm. these, is we see some big differences sometimes in, uh, especially uh, insect damage and that mm -hmm. sort of thing, and I think it's been a big help to, for Sunbelt Ag Expo to let us have these uh, plots down here. We really appreciate that. So. Uh, we, you, you mentioned about a 50% yield loss. That's pretty economically significant, right? Right. So even a conservative 25% yield loss, we're still looking at a $2,500 per or $2,500 yield or economic loss for a 25 acre farm. So it adds up pretty quickly. Yeah, it's a huge number. And if we look at that over the whole state, I mean, it really adds up to a huge number, right? And we're You'd looking look at, at $40 million. Dollars. Yeah, about $40 million pretty conservatively. Uh, as an economic impact uh, just in the state of Georgia and you look at all of the states where Bermuda grass has grown which is where the stem maggot has uh, been showing up I mean it's been reported as far west as Texas and up in Kentucky where I'm from where there's a little bit of Bermuda grass in Virginia uh, in fact I was recently reading I think you shared with me that article there was an article from Canada where they had mm -hmm. seen some uh, stem maggot damage and some uh, ditch banks and whatnot up there so uh, huge, huge problem for us. So you, you've been looking at um, varietal differences. You've been looking at spray patterns. So if we're going to spray for control for this, when should we be spraying for stem maggot? So the extension answer, so we have it on videos, it depends. <laughs> um, years like this where we've had very timely rainfalls, your first application needs to be closer to seven days after you harvest. Mm -hmm. And then your second application seven days after that. If we turn off drier later this summer, uh, maybe you've been in an area with armyworm damage, uh, 
then you can stretch that out to 10 to 14 days for your first application and your second one 10 to 14 after that. There's no point in putting insecticide on until you see good green leaf area come back. Yeah, that's critical because that's where that's what attracting the flies, of course. And, and if it's not uh, green and leafy, then the flies aren't going to be there and therefore your, your spray is going to be off or not. But you've also been doing some work with sticky traps too, right? To be right. able to determine where they're at in the canopy and what time of day they're kind of flying around. Working right. with county agents, I understand, right? Right. So there are currently there are nine county agents through South Georgia that stretch from Brooks County all the way up to Burke County. So a pretty wide range there and what they're all finding um, or found last year and hope to find this year is that they they the flies are most active before 11 a.m. so they're measuring at three different time points during the day up to 11 until 2 and then until 5 in the afternoon um, the flies don't like to be out in the heat of the afternoon they're most active during those morning hours we also looked at the height because we don't know where it would be best to put a sticky card mm -hmm. um, and we looked at three different heights so from 8 16 and 24 inches and very rarely would you find a stem maggot fly at 16 or 24 they like deep down in down that canopy low. they like that eight inch height um, so what we didn't go into the project thinking about that's been a really good implication from it is that's where you need to put your insecticide mm -hmm. um, so we went in looking at a way to say well where do we need to put a card to measure where the flies are but now we know we need when we need to spray and where we need to spray yeah that's that's a really good point is when we're putting that insecticide out we need to be putting it out with quite a bit of uh, a spray volume so we can get it down in the canopy right i mean it's crucial to get canopy penetration there um and, and it really has a major impact on uh the efficacy of that control as well so so um you, you've been doing work with county agents, mm -hmm. you've been doing work at the station in Tifton, and obviously you work here mm -hmm. as well. Uh, what are some other findings that, uh, that you've uh, come across that you'd like to share? So the, as the, the latest finding on my end was the impact that the stem maggot could have on the forage quality. Because it's something at the beginning we didn't think there would be a, a difference. Mm -hmm. But when you get into a situation um, like behind us where you have about 20% yield loss probably, um, that's going to start having a big impact on your crude protein and then your cell solubles and when you roll all those forage quality parameters together it, and take it into the RFQ um, which is kind of the big index for forage quality is what they judge everything through through the, the hay contest mm -hmm. um, we're seeing six to seven percent on average yield, or RF or loss in the RFQ um, so if you're looking at something like 60 70 percent damage in Alicia that's going to obviously be higher, maybe 10 to 11 percent yield yeah. or, or the RFQ loss. Yeah, it can uh, mean the difference between good quality hay mm -hmm. that would be fitting for a lactating beef cow, for example, and something that may not even be uh, fitting for a dry cow, uh, mm -hmm. at least uh, without any supplementation anyway. So it can have some, some significant implications mm -hmm. there uh, for quality and, and, of course, the yield loss that we've already talked about. And you know, you mentioned some of the varietal differences, and, and uh, Dr. Bill Anderson, who, who's not here today, but uh, Bill has been doing a lot of work there in Tipton too, right? He's been right. looking at a large number of uh, accession lines of Bermuda grass and trying to see which lines are most susceptible to the stem maggot, right? Yeah, he's two or three years in now, and they're screening upwards of 300 lines. Wow. Um, yeah. They're all impaired plots, like most small plot work where you have unsprayed um, and then sprayed with the pyrethroids um, to see what is the yield loss of that particular line and then what's the quality difference and then even if we take the stem maggot out of the equation what would the yield and quality be because mm -hmm. we don't want to release anything that's poorer than what we have now so they need to be at least as good as the 85 and he has six or seven lines that he just started increasing to take it to the next step and releasing a cultivar and um, some of those varieties are at least as good as Tipton 85 right. and Coast Cross 2, which so is to, behind us. To, to make that cut, it had to at least yield what 85 would mm -hmm. yield mm -hmm. and show le a, a lower percent damage. Yeah. Now, some of those, I, I've seen some of them in the plots, and I mean, they're very stoloniferous. Mm -hmm. They just have runners like crazy. And 
So I'm, I'm really excited about some of the varieties that he might have uh, on, on the horizon for us. I think there's some real opportunities there. Yeah, all of those that have been continued on in the breeding program, they are very aggressive. So once they are, I don't know how the establishment compares to Tipton 85, um, but seeing these as established plots, they are very aggressive. They're going to spread. Yeah. And I think that's really key to that low percent damage with the stem maggot is they can be very aggressive. They're going to get that green shoot growth up um, and be able to spread and expand even if the stem maggot does attack. Yeah, well, that's been one of the challenges with uh, stem maggot damage is we've had a lot of weed encroachment where we have major problems with stem maggot. And so having a very aggressive variety could, could uh, help on that front as well. So another uh, project that you've been working on that helped us uh, finish up was uh, the new management guide that we have out on the Bermuda grass stem maggot. And uh, that's available on the website, right? What's, uh, give us some of the information about that. So it contains everything we know about the Bermuda grass stem maggot from its life cycle, um, what we generally know about where it came from and how it spread throughout the U.S kind of highlighting some of the, the key research um, that we completed up until its publication um, for how best to manage it. So when do you put out your spray applications? What do you spray? How are you going to spray? Um, at what point should you just renovate? What you should renovate to? So for right now, uh, here we are at the end of July, first part of August, and one of the key things to be thinking about too, in addition to the stem maggot, is fall armyworm. So uh, fall armyworm reports are starting to roll in from across the state, and if we go out there at that seven to 10 day window for, for spraying the pyrethroid, we could go in perhaps with, with something like Demolin or uh, there's a product called the Siege that has the pyrethroid and uh, the same active ingredient that's in Prevathon, which gives very long residual control, not for the stem maggot, but for the fall armyworm. So if we have uh, good residual control for the fall armyworm and the pyrethroid in there to, to kill the stem maggot there, we can, we can get some really good control of, of both of those problems. In fact, I see a fall armyworm crawling right, <laughs> right there right now. They're definitely out here. And, so that's something to consider uh, is to, to include something that's going to give you some residual control for those fall army worms so you're not out here spraying three or four times instead of just one or two times. So uh, be, be uh, thinking about that. More information about those uh, options are available in the pest management handbook uh, that's available on georgiaforges.com. And all the information we've talked about here today is also available on georgiaforges.com. Uh, Lisa and I have written extensively about it in news articles and, and those are also available on the website. So if you have additional questions about that, uh, find that information there on our website at uh, georgiaforges.com and including, uh, we'll provide here a link for that uh, publication on managing the Bermuda grass stem maggot. So for now, we'll just uh, catch you uh, down the road.